Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I am Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Hello, hello, my friends. Welcome back to Breast Cancer Conversations. I am so glad to be joining you again this beautiful morning. And I want to share with you guys, I think some of you know, but not all of you know, that we actually host a Thursday Night Thrivers meetup every single Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. All of the details to RSVP and get the Zoom link can be found on our website at survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events. And we have been getting such great turnout. And I'm asking people how they're hearing about us and finding us. And they said through our podcast, which I just thought was unbelievable. So if you're enjoying the podcast and the show and you want to meet the tribe of amazing breast cancer survivors, thrivers, and havers, we meet up on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Additionally, we also have a growing and thriving community also on our private Facebook page and on Instagram. So if you're not already in these groups and following us on social media, you definitely want to do that so you never miss a beat of what we're up to. All right, so let's dive right into today's beautiful, amazing content. But before we do, I have to give a shout out to our sponsor, Citizens. We know how important clinical trials are for any stage cancer, but especially stage four. We know how hard it is to find the right one. That's why we're so happy to tell you about our friends at Citizens. Citizens is a completely free online service that helps you gain access to all of your medical records and now can also help you explore clinical trial options. Curious to know what clinical trials you're eligible for? Join Citizens for free and find out. You can find out more at citizens forward slash SBC trials, and I'll link to it in the show notes below. And that's citizens spelled C-I-I-T-I-Z-E-N dot com forward slash SBC trials. I would like to welcome back to Breast Cancer Conversations, Abigail Johnston and Anna Spencer. Today's episode is part two of estate planning. It's our estate planning series. You may remember last week when Abigail and Anna shared with us the importance of estate planning and providing access and authority. For example, who has access to what? Who are the decision makers if we can no longer make decisions for ourselves in various medical situations, etc.? Today we pick up on where we left off and turning to estate planning in terms of what happens after our own passing. But let's make sure we make it easy for our loved ones to be able to focus on the good memories they've had with us after our passing and giving them the space and time they need to grieve without having to worry about making all of the logistical plans for funeral arrangements, probate, or guardianship. Abigail and Anna, it is so great to have you back on the podcast. What cares for you during lifetime does not take care of your assets after death. Those are two totally separate roles and separate documents. Welcome to the conversation. We're probably 20% attorneys, 80% counselors. Um, we know the law. We know what's going to happen. 90 10. Exactly. <laughs> we know where this is going. It's getting you to, this, to the comfort level to accept where this is going. So after death. Um, I want to pause for a minute and with this caveat that when dealing with minor children, without a doubt, 100%, you, if you have nothing else in your name except the clothes on your back, if you have minor children, you have to do estate planning. You have to make a decision that if that child is left without a parent, um, hopefully in most cases there's two parents, but if there's a child left without a parent, who the guardian of that child will become. Um, I'm going to just be direct that oftentimes we have life insurance that would be available for that child. And all of a sudden, every family member comes out of the woodwork and is happy to be a part of that child's life because um, good intentions or not, there's always some struggle. The absolute worst thing you could do for a child that's just lost one or both parents is have in limbo who their next guardian will be. So I I just want to make that that's my soapbox moment. You know, um, I joke all the time that you know, a lot of people say, I, I don't know who I'd want that guardian to be. Well, we know who you don't want that guardian to be, which is, you know, Department of Children and Family. You don't want, you know, there are certain people you could probably make a list a mile long of who will not raise your children. That's the reason you have to choose someone who will raise your children. So um, if you want any say in that, so I'm going to take that soapbox moment that that is a non-negotiable for me. If nothing else, we've got to establish who the guardian will be for your children. Um, and in Florida, what document does that? Believe it or not, it's the last will and testament. Now, 
the probate court, which I want to talk about generally what that is and what that looks like, because everyone thinks it's a four letter word. It's not as horrible as everybody thinks, but we'll come back to that. But um, that document's entered as an official document and as the actual testament of the person that died. So then that's used as evidence to go before the dependency court and family law courts and whatever, which is Abigail's area of expertise. But um, it all goes to that direction to say, we now need to officially have this child under someone else's purview. It's confirmed that it was your testimony and your wishes that were there. So that's why that's important. What is probate in general? A lot of people get very confused on what probate is. Probate is a court process that if somebody dies with an asset that we don't have access to, so back to that access and authority. If the family does not have access to an asset, we have to go to probate court and get that asset retitled. Now I'm, I'm simplifying this greatly, but we go through a process to pay creditors if we need to pay final expenses. There's a whole process, but in general, the purpose of probate is to re um, assign or reallocate an asset from someone that's died. So how do you avoid probate? You create access after death. That's really what it comes down to is you have to have access after death for your family. So we're coming full circle back to Janice's question here. And so thank you for that and your patience, Janice, as I kind of worked into that. Um, if you have a beneficiary on an account, that is the silver bullet, whatever you want to call it, that is the go-to, that is the gold star. That it gives access outside of probate, outside of anything else. It tells that financial institution, when I die, this is who receives that account. So it will, without a doubt, supersede anything you put in a will, which will come back to the will situation. But that is a fantastic tool that is very much overlooked. Um, I'm constantly shocked at how many people have life insurance policies with no beneficiaries listed. And, you know, financial accounts, retirement accounts. So what triggers the need for probate is an asset your family doesn't have access to when you die. So one of the greatest benefits of estate planning is making sure every asset there's access for the family. So kind of back to what is probate. Um, so if we have to go to probate, um, now speaking in general, again, um, my, my purview is mostly Florida law. Um, a lot of people think if you have a last will and testament, you avoid probate. That's not true. To avoid probate, we have access to all the assets. We don't need the judge to come in. What a will is, now let me clarify for a minute. We were talking earlier about advanced directives, end of life. Those are called living wills. And I'm from Florida. And if anyone here is from California, I apologize. I'm about to pick on you. California comes up with lots of crazy phrases, and so they didn't want it to be a last will, so they called it a living will. While you're living, what are your choices? But don't confuse the two. There's California even has renamed the do not resuscitate order, and now I can't remember what it is, but California has all kinds of crazy things that then we figure out later. But a living will is your medical advance directives. A last will and testament is for your assets after death. So just make sure you know the distinction between those two. So a last will and testament is basically a letter to the probate judge. And I'm simplifying this greatly and legal professors would be all over me. But for practical purposes, it's saying, dear judge, if my assets end up in probate court, here's what I want you to do with them. Here's how I want to receive them. It doesn't create probate. It doesn't avoid probate. It simply says, if I end up in probate judge, here's what I want to happen. Um, we have what we call intestacy laws, which are basically if you don't draft documents and you live in that state, whatever state you live in of residency, it's giving you notice of what the courts will do. 70, I think it was 72% was the last statistic I saw of Americans die without a will, the last will and testament. So we have to have some process in place to determine who are your next of kin, who are gonna be the heirs, and that's don't assume you know who that will be, especially if you have blended families. Blended families bring a whole nother level um, to next of kin and heir. So don't assume, please, that you know how things will fall. Check the laws in your state or draft a will. Um, so we'll come back to that. But in general, a will is a letter to the probate judge. It doesn't preclude or create the need for probate. It's simply saying, if I end up in probate. So how do we avoid probate? We create access. And back to Janice's questions, beneficiaries are the number one way to create access. 
Um, some financial institutions will call them a POD, which is called payable on death or TOD, transfer on death. Um, basically the same concept, when you die, who gets the account? So you wanna create that access um, by using those tools whenever possible. But I go back to my soapbox that if you have minor children, you've got to have a will in place to deal with the guardianship. And even if everything you own has a beneficiary designation, I still strongly recommend you have a basic last will and testament because there could be something that happens you just can't control. You win the lottery and die the next day or something not nearly as much fun. You are in a car accident and someone's at fault and there's insurance owed or there's a lawsuit that stems from your death. Those will always funnel into the probate court. So there may be things you can't control or you can't plan for. But what you can plan for, anything you do currently own, you want to make sure um, has a beneficiary designation whenever possible. Mm -hmm. There was a question in uh, the chat also about guardians and how young, uh, or, or I guess how old do you have to be to be a guardian? I would assume it's 18. 18. Or is it something else? Okay. Um, it would be, by law, it's 18, but it's still at the judge's discretion. It would be very difficult to have a judge that would award a 18-year-old guardian of a 10-year-old, so to speak, a sibling-type situation, simply because that guardian doesn't have the ability probably to support themselves, yet alone another child. So, But a guardian has to be 18 under the law, um, but there's a lot of discretionary power in the judge as to whether that's a good fit. They're looking for the best interest of the child. And just because you label that person to be the guardian, you're electing them basically um, and asking the judge to strongly consider them. Um, there are laws in place as to who can and can't be guardian, obviously, but um, there's also some discretionary power is, is the child going to be well cared for in this person's home? So, One thing that I run into quite a bit with people in the metastatic community is when they are no longer with the other parent of their children. They may have a new relationship, they may not, but there's always the question of, um, is there a way to divest the biological parent who's maybe no longer as involved with the children? Um, I'm probably gonna punt this back to Abigail because this is her area, but so I could <laughs> a question she knows the answer to. Um, in general, you cannot terminate another parent's parental rights simply by drafting a will. That part I can tell you without a doubt. Um, that person is a biological parent, whether you like them or not. Um, and unless there are extreme circumstances which have gone through child services and the court process, um, and I would at least say in the state of Florida, it is very difficult, which Abigail can expand on more, to terminate parental rights. So, um, you cannot simply by estate planning exclude the other parent from your child's life. That's just not an option. But what you can do is say if this parent is found either does not want to serve, no longer wants to care for the children, if they're basically estranged and that's not going to happen, if they're found to be unfit for whatever reason or they're willing to give up their parental rights, you can elect who that next person in line will be. But you can't supersede those parental rights. So you want to spin that but off? you from could you could control the purse strings with estate planning, right? Absolutely. Your purse strings without a doubt. So um, let's talk about children and guardianships in general. When we have these beautiful babies that drive us crazy later in life, they come into this world butt naked. They don't own a thing. Everything they own, you have purchased for them. So you are actually guardian of their person as their parent. Um, a child in general doesn't own assets unless you've got some child stars, which is a whole nother conversation. But in general, at least in Florida, they can't even receive more than $15,000. So if there were any sort of inheritance or otherwise where a minor child would receive more money than that, or even if they own more, they've had a killer lawn business for the summer or whatever, washing cars, whatever it is. Um, if they have more than $15,000 in their name, they have to have what's called a guardian of the property. So there's a guardian of the person, there's a guardian of the property. So if there were a car accident, for example, and um, the parent died, but the child was entitled to receive proceeds from the insurance or otherwise, that guardian would be in charge of that money. So um, yes, to go back to Abigail's point, if there is money to be had for the children, um, you can request a guardian of the property, 
But what I would suggest so much more strongly is to set up a trust where there is a trust in place and the trust will receive that money. So let's talk about trust for a second. A trust, and again, I'm simplifying this more than any law professor would want to, is a separate entity. It's a lot like a corporation or an LLC. It owns its own assets. And I like to think of it like a five-gallon bucket. You're creating this bucket, and then we're putting things in the bucket, the life insurance and other proceeds. And you create the trust, and you're kind of the CEO of this company, Target, Home Depot, whatever you want. And you set up the rules. When does the child get the money? Do we pay for college? You know, what are the rules as to when this money is spent? And as long as you're alive and competent, you can change those rules. You know, you can say when they get the money, you can take the money out, use it for your own benefit. It's your money until you die. And then upon your death, a new trustee, a new CEO. So God forbid a CEO of a company dies. They're not going to close the doors. They do a press release, new CEO, and they continue the purpose of the company. The trust is very much the same. So you're the trustee and upon your death, a new person steps in. They can't change any of the rules anymore because you were the only person who could do that as the creator of the trust. But now they follow the instructions you've left for them as to when that money is distributed. So I jokingly say I'm a really mean parent because um, we have life insurance and minor children and they would, we're worth more dead than alive. So all this money would come in for my minor children. And even if they weren't minors in their 20s, they would not receive the money from this life insurance. They just wouldn't mentally be prepared for it. So we have it established, just as um, it's common knowledge for all my clients, because we talk about it all the time, that from 18 to 24, we will pay for college. We will pay for your housing, your books, whatever you need. But I can't force my kids to go to college, whether I'm here or not. But if they don't go to college, they're not getting any money. That, that's what it is. They can figure it out themselves. They can go invent the next whatever and be rich, and that's great. Or they can, you know, work fast food and figure out this is not their favorite thing to do. So whatever the situation is, we will, we are strongly encouraging through the purse strings for them to go to college. Um, if they don't go to college, that's fine. And then we have ages and we had 25, 30, 35 or 30, 35, 40, um, that then they actually start receiving distributions. So we've established this trust, this bucket, we're going to funnel money into it. Um, upon our death, all that life insurance money will go into this bucket and we've set the rules in place as to when and how our children will get the money. So um, now I will make very clear, the person that is the trustee managing the money is not the person who they will live with and you know get them to school and homework and volleyball practice and all that other stuff. That's a totally different person because that person is loving and amazing with the day-to-day, -day, horrible with money. But the person we have for the money is not a kid person, but they're great with money. So we have very distincts and it creates a check and balance um, to say, I need money for this and that. And, you know, keeping that balance in place, hopefully that makes sense. So your children really need two people in their lives. The person that's going to raise them until they're 18. And then the person that's managing the money, which will have a little bit of a parental feel to it because they're going to help guide those decisions. Okay. You need a car for college. You need a Honda Accord. You don't need a Corvette. You know, these are the decisions that are going to come into play. So there is still some parental guidance with those first strings as well. So there's a question in the chat about revocable versus irrevocable trusts. Mm -hmm. I want to speak a little bit to that. Yes. I know that um, can get complicated too. <laughs> Traditionally, or typically, I should say, with estate planning, we do revocable trust, which means you can always access the money um, and you can change the designations and distribution rules. So, like I said, I, I have children, they're still minors, but younger, and um, I get this a lot with clients that says, well, my son was doing great and then he married this girl I don't like, you know, so all of a sudden... Now they're real concerned or, you know, hey, I thought she was going to be OK, but this guy's great and he makes a lot of money and she doesn't need as much. So life can change. Whatever that situation is in the family, life can change. So revocable has the flexibility that it's still your money. You have full access to it um, and you can change those designations. Irrevocable means it is set in stone. What goes in there you don't have access to. You can't make changes as to the distributions. Um, the only reason we typically deal with that type of trust is for taxing purposes. Now, this year currently, and tomorrow will be an interesting day, but currently under the current administration, um, the you can have 11 million point four something or other um, 
federal level inheritance without paying any taxes. So it's very unusual to have an estate that exceeds that amount that we have to deal with the taxing purposes. Now, again, huge caveat, Florida follows the federal law as far as taxing. Other states, California, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, um, have state inheritance taxes that you've got to make sure you know about. Um, but Florida, we follow whatever the federal is. That's why it works out well here. So irrevocable are typically because we're trying to avoid some sort of tax hit, to be honest. We need to get the money out of your name before you die. So it's not subject to death taxes and estate taxes after your death. So most traditional estate planning, the, the whole point of a trust is to manage money after your death. A fair amount of us with metastatic breast cancer and young children. Mm -hmm. And the question a lot of times is what happens to either the money that I have made that I have set aside for my kids if and when my husband remarries after my death. And so it is the trust, the document that you can set some of those limitations on um, how the money can be used if there's a second marriage, children, et cetera. What happens? Yes. So there's a two-part answer. The bucket, the trust, so to speak, we were talking about, absolutely, you can have those restrictions in place. This money is for my children, no matter what X, Y, Z. The problem comes into play when you're trying to put that money into the bucket, because oftentimes that's marital money, which is co-owned by the marriage, so to speak, of both spouses. So if you put money in a trust for the children only, you're and not for the spouse and future marriages, you're basically taking it away from your spouse. And the question becomes, which I can't always answer for you, and maybe Abigail, you could give some insight on this, but basically you can't take marital money and take it away from the other part of the marriage. So it's, yes, you can create the bucket that has those restrictions that it can't be used for future marriages and other stepchildren or otherwise, the question becomes is what assets do you have that are not marital assets that you can put into that bucket? That's where the bit of the complication comes in. And um, so, yes, the trust can say that. The question is, is what do you fund that trust with? And when you're talking about putting things into the trust, yes. um, are you talking about um, the beneficiaries, say, of your account, like a 401k or life insurance? Yeah, um, pretty much anything can go into the trust. There, now we talked about their or death or estate taxes, whichever you want to call them. Um, some assets still have income taxes. So if you have a 401k or an IRA that you put that money in pre-tax from your employer, when you pull that money out, if it's subject to income tax, it's going to be subject to income tax after your death too. So I don't want you to feel that everything is tax-free. Um, we may not have the inheritance tax, but it still could be subject to income tax. But um, some things will get paid into the trust. It's called funding the trust. If I'm going to use an actual legal phrase for you, funding the trust. Um, the trust will be fun, has to be funded with something, but a lot of that funding will come after death. So, for example, I don't physically have my life insurance money, but upon my death, I've directed that that check be paid and funded into the trust. Um, Oftentimes, you can have certain types of accounts labeled in the trust now, brokerage accounts. Some people even have checking and savings accounts. You cannot, during your lifetime, put a retirement account in the trust, an IRA or 401k, because that's got to be owned by the individual to have those tax benefits. But the beneficiary of the IRA and 401k can list the trust. The trust has to be created to accept that type of account. It has to be created to accept a retirement account because of the taxing implications that come with that. So that's an important question to ask if you create a trust is, does this trust have the ability to hold a retirement account? But in general, um, things that don't have those taxing considerations, brokerage accounts, money markets, checking, savings, um, those types of things can go ahead now during your lifetime, be funded and titled in the trust. And then other assets can be funneled into that trust after your death. So we have so a very range, large okay. waiting for that life insurance money. It has very minimal funding, we'll say that. And then when and if, because um, the hope is now we're working towards college funding. But so we have a big bucket ready to accept that money. Hopefully that makes sense, but it's not all in there yet. We've been talking about a lot of different terms and, and I haven't heard you throw in things like um, executors and, and labels like that. 
could we run through a few of those definitions that would be yes. um, helpful for people to know just so the, the terms are not um, out of left field? Because some of them are still in Latin, aren't they? <laughs> we love Latin. Um, okay, so taking a huge step back to pre-death documents, you have the healthcare surrogate. Your surrogate is the person stepping in. They call that a healthcare proxy also. Um, your agent is the person under the power of attorney. So those people care for you while you're alive. You cannot have a surrogate agent or proxy after death. So those phrases are all pre-death phrases. After death, it's very important to keep distinctions between the probate and the trust. Um, under probate, remember we said, if you have to go to the judge, well, who is that person that actually goes to the judge, actually takes the will, actually files things with the court? Most states call it an executor. Uh, state of Florida calls it a personal representative. Some um, states call it an administrator. Um, so any of those three are really, you know, um, interchangeable. So executor, power of, um, excuse me, executor, personal representative, administrator. That is a court appointed position. So the will might say, I elect my daughter to be my executor. You're not that executor until the court says, yep, and that order is signed with a lovely red stamp from the court on it. So that's an elected position, so to speak, until the court solidifies that that person doesn't have any authority. Um, with the trust, you have usually the settler or the grantor is the person who creates the document. So that person will always be the same person. That's the person who created this document, has the ability to revoke or amend the document. And then you have the trustee. That was kind of, I was comparing it to the CEO. That's the person who's going to administer it based on what you've told them. So during your lifetime, you can be that trustee and you can manage that money and take care of all those assets. After death, a new trustee will be assigned um, to manage that money. I'm trying to think if there's any Thank other beneficiaries. Beneficiaries is kind of general. It's the person who receives the benefit of something. Um, so um, whether you're a beneficiary on a bank account or a beneficiary of a trust or the beneficiary of the will, the beneficiary is the person receiving a benefit. It's kind of a general phrase. So I can't say that specific to one thing. Mm -hmm. What about corporate trustees? And some banks do have an office that has a corporate trustee. How, how does that help when you're looking at a trust? I wouldn't say it helps. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, corporate trustees are an option. Um, they are very uh, rigid, very expensive. Trusts usually come with a lot of discretionary powers. So back to being the me mom status, if my kids have a severe injury or accident and they need medical care and they need money, the trustee has the authority to pay that. Um, you know, making those decisions about cars to buy and things, there's a lot of discretionary power. It's hard for a corporate trustee to initiate um, discretionary powers. So my trust says at 30, 35, and 40, my kids get checks. Those are not discretionary. Those are set. Those are requirements. It's really hard for a corporate trustee, though. They can meet those, those requirements. It's really hard for them to manage the discretionary aspects. Um, as far as expenses, the bank usually has a financial advisor to oversee the money. Then they have a trust department, then they have a trustee, then they have um, an attorney for the trustee, then they have an attorney for the bank. So you can see the fees continue to build. It is an option if you don't feel you have anybody that can step into that role. Personally, it is a last resort for me because the expense associated with them administering your trust is astronomical and the time it takes for them to make a decision because they've got to go through so many hands and so many people have to rubber stamp the process. It takes forever for anything to get accomplished. So you can pretty much wipe out all the discretionary aspects and just get to the basic distributions. Um, but it is an option. Um, there's just a lot of hands in the pot in that situation. We got a question in the chat here about moving. So if you say live in Florida, put together your will, all of your advanced directives, and then you decide to go up into the cold, which I don't know why anybody would want to do that. But anyway, they move up <laughs> north somewhere, let's say Wisconsin. Then what? Does the will work? 
you have to have it reviewed by an attorney in that state. Um, Florida is pretty generous with um, our signing requirements. So we're usually good if you leave Florida. We have a lot of problems with people who come to Florida from other states and they don't have a notary stamp. They don't have witnesses. They don't have the self-proof affidavit, which you don't need to know about, but they don't have all those, you know, nuances that Florida needs. Florida goes above and beyond because to be honest, we love retirees and we want people to come here and to live here. And we're very generous tax wise to everybody, especially the elderly and after death here in Florida. So they have a lot of that already set in place where other states are not quite where Florida is. So you definitely need to have it reviewed in the state you moved to. Now, with that being said, a little caveat there, the trust is a little different because the trust was created in Florida. It will always, quote unquote, live in Florida. It has its principal place of business in Florida. So even if you move to Wisconsin, you still have a Florida trust unless you take the effort to change that and to reassign um, it under Wisconsin law. You may live in Wisconsin. Your will needs to be updated. Your healthcare surrogate needs to be looked at, whatever. But your trust still lives in Florida. So that's a little nuance for that. So that just depends on which set of laws you want to be under, basically, and which tax laws you want to be under for your trust. Interesting situation where a couple left North Carolina, um, still owned a home there, kept it as a, um, you know, a weekend getaway and even rented it out on Airbnb and all that. But North Carolina has a lot of um, taxes, Florida doesn't, and they continued to tax them and claim them as residents in North Carolina because they wanted that homestead tax issue. So they had to fight that issue in North Carolina that they owned a home there, but they were now Florida residents. So it is certainly something that has to be addressed and looked at. Um, but simply, you know, I get a question a lot that if I happen to be traveling and I die in Alaska, am I in trouble? No, you're still a Florida resident. You know, we, we've got to figure out how to get you home, but you're still a Florida resident just because you happen to be there on vacation when you died. And, you know, it's more about a logistical issue than a legal issue at that point. Mm -hmm. And my grandparents who were snowbirds um, actually paid for the special insurance that if they died somewhere else, that it would pay to fly their body back to wherever they wanted to be buried. So there, there are all kinds of extra things that, that you can do. But um, I, I remember the first day of Will's Trust and Estates, well, a few, a few eons ago now, um, my professor got up and said, when should you, um, when should you have a, or do a will? When, when should you consider estate planning? And her perspective was whenever your life changes, that you should relook at whatever your plans are. Um, you move, you get married, you have a child, um, your child gets married, you have a grandchild, that these are all triggers to then relook at what do I have in place whenever something like that changes? Um, and I'm probably the only person who I made my husband before we got married have his estate planning done and have life insurance before we got married. Um, because I just wanted things to be to be set, right? Because it's it's important to have those things set. So yes, I'm I'm the the crazy person who was running into that. And when I was diagnosed, the very first thing that I wanted to do was update my estate planning, primarily because I was um, I was preemptively angry at this hypothetical person that was going to marry my husband after I died. And I went a little nutso <laughs> um, in the middle of that. But, you know, I think that that everybody starts to think about this when you have children, when something serious happens, when, to your point, Anna, when you see someone else's um, estate planning go well or not. And I, I have two, both of my grandfathers have passed. So I had two experiences with this um, as a young adult. When my maternal grandfather died, they had done estate planning. Um, they had put it somewhere where no one could find it. Um, and my grandfather ended up, um, he was in uh, a sept, he, wanted, he had sepsis and he went into a coma. So he was on life support for several extra days because they couldn't find the correct documents. And so that really drove home to me. You, you spend all this money, you spend all this time to put together these documents, make sure they're in a place that's, that's accessible um, and it's easy to find in, in a crisis, like when your, your brain is not working. Um, my grandfather had also not 
planned anything with the funeral. Um, he literally had his money, child of, a dep- of the depression. He had his money, I think, at eight or nine different banks. Um, and it took a very long time to probate his estate because it was, um, I love my, I loved my grandfather, but it was a mess. It was a total mess. And it took a long time. Mm-hmm. Then my, my paternal grandfather, when he passed away, he had the life insurance to fly his body back up to Ohio to be buried. He had prepaid all of the, and arranged all of the funeral arrangements, prepaid it all. So my grandmother literally showed up. Um, he had some of you may have uh, pensions or 401ks or annuities or some of these other complicated things that have extra um, death riders Mm -hmm. so that um, my grandmother literally went from having this much money and it doubled when my grandfather died because he had all these extra things um, that automatically gave her more money. And so you have those people who are very thoughtful about things. And then you have the people who just, you know, they have it set up, but they're not too concerned about the details. And so I I saw those differences with my grandmothers. My maternal grandmother had to make a lot of decisions about the funeral, about what to do, about where she was going to live and all of that. My paternal grandmother, her life went on exactly the way it had always been. And so as much as these things are hard, as much as these things are, um, I think culturally, sometimes they're more difficult Um, my father-in-law, for instance, refuses, he's been in a nursing home since 2005 and he refuses to do any of these things because Mm -hmm. I think in his mind, as soon as you start talking about it, that means it's going to happen. But I saw as, as a child, as a granddaughter, how much, how much of a different experience it was for my paternal grandmother that she was able to just grieve. She didn't have to make any decisions. She didn't have to figure stuff out. Um, and I've seen that as kind of that last expression of love that you can give to your family, that you've, you've made it easier for them logistically, um, not the emotional part, but at least the, the logistical part. So, um, that, that, those are the kinds of things I think about in, in these contexts. I'll just add, I think it's very generational. There's a lot of, it's none of their business. They'll find out when I die. And the problem is, is a lot of times stuff is lost assets. You know, we had someone today that we're opening a probate from 15 years ago because an asset appeared, you know, so, um, you know, those things happen. And, you know, I, I kind of joke, I'm, I'm one of uh, three daughters and we're all very type A should have all been the oldest. Um, you know, I'm in law, my middle sister's in insurance and my youngest sister's in medicine. So um, talk about, you know, we've got every base covered and the three of us know absolutely, not absolutely nothing, but very little because my parents, despite our professions, keep everything very close to the best. So it's not personal to you as the person. It's it's just the way that they are. You know, I, my mother is um, has played piano beautifully for years. All of her music for her funeral is picked out, but we have no idea if she has life insurance, you know, so these are the things that. <laughs> You're just like, okay, so that's what's important to her. And and we'll just figure out the rest later. So this is one of those love things, but it would be a lot easier if they would share more information um, with all of us. So um, I just wanted to add to that one quick real caveat. And I didn't mean to jump in Abigail. If if anyone is a veteran, it is extremely important. Your family have a copy of your um, discharge paperwork. It's usually DD 214, but I was given another number the other day, which was new to me, but it's the discharge paperwork that shows what um, benefits your family is entitled to, what benefits you're entitled to, um, aid and attendance, which is in-home care, things like that, um, funerals. If you intend to be buried in a national cemetery, there are uh, funeral services, um, excuse me, funeral companies that are contracted um, that will pay to get you to that cemetery. So before you go and pay for another service, see who's contracted with the Veterans Affairs to uh, for that specific um, um, cemetery and whatever you want there too. But if your family doesn't have a copy of your discharge paperwork, it's extremely hard to get it from the VA. So keep that readily available mm. um, and get that. It's really hard after someone's death to get that proof of service. Um, it's an uphill battle. So that's just something else to keep in mind. So many details. So many details, which again is why sitting down with somebody who really knows their stuff versus pulling a form offline is just so important. 
um, which is why I freak out. Anybody talks about doing their will on legal zoom. And I'm sure all these people and all these support groups are like, why are you losing your mind? But I, I lose my mind <laughs> when people talk about that because it is so important. There's so many nuances that, that people just don't know. This was just an amazing conversation. I really appreciate the in-depth. I've been taking notes over here, and I'm sure I will share notes with Abigail and everyone and maybe turn some of this content also into like a blog or an FAQ so that people have this information later on. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly an honor. And I mean, I have I know Abigail. I, I know if she is anything, she is an amazing advocate and has got your back on any situation. And um, I just, I say, you know, if Abigail's running the ship, it, great things are coming. So um, I'm thrilled to be here. And thank you, Laura, for having me. And thank you guys for letting me answer some questions thank for you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Anna. Thank, thank you, you, Abigail. Thanks, thank you, Anna. Thanks, Abigail. Thank you for tuning in and listening to our podcast. If you would like to find out more about our organization and upcoming events and ways to connect, you can find out more by visiting our website at survivingbreastcancer.org. I would like to acknowledge that all of the information on our podcast is from personal experiences and it is not a substitute for professional medical advice. You should always consult your medical care team. If you're looking for specific topics or would like to be a guest on our show, feel free to contact me directly at laura at survivingbreastcancer.org. And of course, we have a couple social media handles you can follow us at as well. For example, survivingbreastcancer.org, all one word, as well as our podcast specifically, Breast Cancer Conversations. Until next time, keep on thriving.